the fast track. Today we are talking about can you trust God? Can you trust the Bible? Because honestly, sometimes there's a lot of questions about whether these are really trustworthy. Dad, do you remember when I went to downtown Cincinnati and served at that soup kitchen? Oh yeah, with that Muslim had that question about your faith and about the... Uh... Yeah, so while I was down there, there was this Muslim guy who had asked me why I trust the Bible and how I can trust God because with all of the copying errors and all the different translations, how could it possibly be correct? Well, that is exactly why I brought a leaf blower and toilet paper today to answer that question. Of course it is. Well, I think a lot of people have questions, and uh, I'll show you how a leaf blower really helped explain that. But a lot of people have questions, like your Muslim friend. How do we know the Bible's trustworthy? What's the evidence for it? What about the copying process? You know, over the years, I've spoken at colleges. I've spoken with skeptics. People are unconvinced, saying, genuinely, how can an educated person believe that the Bible is actually historically reliable? What are some of the questions you've had? I've had a lot of questions with the copying errors. With There's so many times that this book has been copied that... Mm -hmm. It has to have so many different errors in it and like different words that are not correct and different translations that say different things. Sure. Well, I think uh, one of the questions that first comes up is, is there any evidence besides the Bible saying it's God's word? Is there any evidence? Right. And there is. First of all, the Bible makes claims, archaeological claims. You, know, you have to go up to Jerusalem. This a day's journey from this place to this place, you'll find this city. And over and over again, archaeology confirms these specific locations, these specific places the Bible refers to. It also has again and again, archaeology refers to different characters. For example, I got a chance to see Pontius Pilate. There is actually, for years, people said, the Bible can't be true. There's no such thing as Pontius Pilate. And sure enough, they found a big old stone. Yeah, got a chance to see it in I Israel last year. I got to see it this past summer, and it is so cool. It's sitting in the middle of um, maritime, maritime yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and maritime, one of Herod's palaces. Yeah, and so there was an example where for years people said there's no evidence for the Bible, the Bible's making up characters, and sure enough, here was actual archaeological evidence that people the Bible said existed really did. And then again with David, they said that there was no way that David and Goliath could have existed, yet mm -hmm. they recently uncovered a gate with two cities, which was talked about in the Bible. Yeah, the Bible claims that there's a city called Shaharim, which means a, a city with two gates. And there's never, ever, 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 ever been found anywhere in, the, anywhere in the world a city with two gates because you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that because there'd be two weak spots. But and that just would open you up to being attacked. But sure enough, right at the top of the hill, uh, above the valley where David and Goliath fight, they found one of the first ever cities, and in that city, indeed, was two gates, Shaharim. So there's lots of evidence for it. But in those claims, there's also ways in which the manuscripts, where people say, well, we only have a few copies of it. That's not actually true. No, it's definitely not true. If you compare the Bible's number of uh, manuscripts compared to other books, uh, Gaelic Wars, the Iliad, Homer, the Bible has 24,000 copies of manuscripts for the New Testament compared to 10, 20, or even 70 for the other documents. So the Bible's not only manuscript uh, heavy, it's in a shoulder over shoulder category above right. all the rest. Far more than you could ever possibly imagine. Yeah, but the copying process is interesting because those people who say hundreds of years of copying errors really don't know what happened with the Dead Sea Scrolls. I actually got to see a place where they made the copying of the scrolls and it's in a city that was owned by the Essenes. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. If you want to grab a copy of our scroll, sure. while they're in the city, they take out the original scroll and they take out a new scroll, which is made out of animal hide, which honestly is kind of gross. But well, the reason they did that, though, is they'd have the, the original they're going to copy here, the blank one here, and they made it out of animal skin because it took so long to copy, it took so long to make, that if you went through this process, you wanted this thing to last for a long, long time. Right. So tell us how that process of copying from one to a blank one went through to make sure there weren't any errors. Right. Well, a lot of times they would have four different people mm -hmm. to be able to write just one letter. Really? Yeah, just one letter. All right. So the first person would read the letter on the original manuscript. Okay. So say it's in English and the letter is A. Okay. So you read the word A. Then you have somebody who checks the word A, make sure they read it correctly. Mm-hmm. So A, A. Then I write it down, A. So then, yeah, so the third person will write it down. Okay. And the fourth person checks it to make sure they wrote down the right letter. So four people per letter to make sure that process went through. Right. Exactly. Well. I think because many of us, you know, we take notes for school, we copy things, with our handwriting is so bad, we assume everyone else's handwriting is as bad as yours are, and mine is well, horrible. Well, yours is definitely bad. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> in fact, I got a chance to see a full scroll of the Pentateuch. That's the first five books of the Bible. We enrolled it in our church. We did. And let people come forward and see it. And within two copying steps, we got back 900 years and just got to see, it's like looking at a laser printer. 
These scribes, and they were apprenticed for generations to be able to print this in such a way. You cannot believe a human wrote this stuff. It is like it just came off your laser printer as you're doing it. Which is so incredible. And then we found the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. And I got to go see where they found these. Yeah, in Qumran. In Qumran. And these put us back so many years and so many hundreds of years that we could compare hundreds of years before to the yeah. copies that we originally had. Yeah, and, and there were virtually no errors in it. It yeah. just, again, confirmed the copying process. And the reason they did that is because the Bible wasn't just Bible trivia. It wasn't just an opportunity for us to go, oh, I want to know some facts about history or archaeology. Christians believe, and what God teaches is that this is His Word. This is life. And in fact, I was reading in Ezekiel recently where God turns to Ezekiel and says, Ezekiel, eat my scroll, partake of it into your belly, take it down into yourself, eat of my scroll, because as we devour God's promises and we devour God's words, it was to bring us life into our life. And so that's why God did it. And so in honor of that, I thought I would eat the scroll for you. Seriously, mm. I don't think he actually meant to eat the scroll. Well, thank goodness this one isn't made out of animal skin. It's made out of rice paper. I'm probably going to eat the animal skin mm. too, but... I think what he means is... It's actually kind of tasty. I think oh. he doesn't mean to actually eat the Tastes paper. like honey. <laughs> well, in that process, rather than making it out of paper or something that you know, wouldn't last very long, they actually made it out of animal skin, so it lasts for literally hundreds of years right. before they made a copy. But then before it was certified, they had what were called counters. The counters would actually come in when it was all complete and count the letters from beginning to end and from end to beginning. And oh, that they must have taken a long time. Well, it did. It took years to make a manuscript because of the precision. And they knew the middle letter. And if they counted from end to middle and, and beginning to middle and didn't come to the right letter, they had to start all over again oh, and relook and find the problem. Then once those counters applied to it, they again came back and had counters that counted the middle, not letter, but word. And they had to make sure they hit the right word before it would be certified as an actual scroll that could be trusted. Wow, that would take forever. But how do we know that it's actually God's word that's being delivered here? And now we're back to toilet paper and leaf blowers. Oh, of course we are. So let me show you the process. Come over here on my left-hand side. All right. The Bible uses a word in 2 Timothy that says that all Scripture is God-breathed, which literally means the very breath of God came over and extended upon these human authors. So you find different human personalities writing the Bible all through time. Some were very uh, long-winded, like Paul. Paul. I love where Peter says, even I don't understand what Paul's saying. Um, there's other places where, like in the book of Mark, it's written very magazine format. But this is the process where God carried these folks along. So while they were writing, what they were recording was historically accurate. And so though they were sinful beings, God carried them along or superintended them so that they would be able to hear and see God's word without error. Let's show, show us how this works. There we go. That's the talking. Yep, it was there. Uh-huh. All right. So in that process, you can take that one off. All right. What happened is that the wind carries along the toilet paper in the same way that ancient documents like the Bible were more like toilet paper in that it was unrolled rather than a book that's unfolded. And so God carried along these writers so everything they wrote in these books we call the canon of Scripture were inspired and error-free. Not because the human beings were error-free, but because the process was. So let's inspire some of the Old and New Testament. Why don't you grab that leaf blower? I'll load mine back up and we'll do it again. I'll be the New Testament, you be the Old Testament. I'll even load mine up twice so we can do a little double. All right. So, again, in 1 Peter it says that God inspired His Word. These are the very words of God, the very breath of God. And this is why we can not only trust the Bible, we can trust His promises as well. Ready, New Testament? I I'll think so. I'll be the so. Old Testament. Here we go. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. And so today in Fast Track, we're going to discover that not only is God's word true, but so are his promises. And Abraham's going to need that promise because he's coming face to face with an incredible challenge from God. Because God turns to Abram and says, I want you to sacrifice your only begotten son, Isaac. Will he be able to trust that God's not just viable, he's actually reliable? So grab your tic-tac-toe boards and let's get on the Fast Track. 